Hi everybody, in this video I'll be doing a detailed review of my latest Tudor costume, including information on how I constructed all of the pieces and a pattern review on the patterns that I used. The first piece is my shift, which I actually created for my first Tudor costume, so I'm just reusing it again. It is made following the smock pattern generator from elizabethancostume.net and I used a handkerchief weight linen from fabricstore.com. I sewed all of the seams by machine and then I flat felt them all by hand. And then the neckline and the cuffs are actually embroidered along the edge with some black embroidery floss. I really love this shift and I love the pattern and I know I need to make more because this one gets really dirty. I have to oxy clean it after every uh, weekend at the festival because the cuffs especially get really dirty but I do like it a lot and I highly recommend the pattern. I didn't really have to make any changes to it. Actually initially I made a change to it because I thought that I wanted it different somehow and then it turned out that the pattern was correct all along and I should have followed the directions completely in the first place. The next piece is my bum roll and again this is the bum roll that I made for my first costume. I don't see a lot of point in having more than one bum roll. This bum roll is made out of muslin. I got it at Fabric Wholesale Direct and it is stuffed with cotton batting that I actually got by unwinding a bunch of cotton balls and there's actually a piece in it that is some old knitting I had laying around because I didn't have enough cotton balls. The next piece I have is a stiffened front kirtle and so this acts as both a pair of bodies to help shape my torso into the proper conical shape and also the kirtle for the dress and the visible underskirt. This kirtle was made self-drafted mostly based on the last kirtle that I made, which was loosely based on the corset that I made based on the pattern generator at elizabethancostume.net. So just to give credit to credit was due, once upon a time this started out as my Elizabethan corset pattern, but it has gone through quite a few iterations since then. The fabric is an embroidered silk taffeta that I got at Toto Fabrics. That it is underlined with a handkerchief weight linen in the color Krista Natural from fabricstore.com. The bodice actually has some mid-weight linen and cotton codal as an understructure to hold the boning, and it's boned with reed and plastic zip tie boning. The bottom hem has some woven horsehair interfacing to add stiffness to it, and it's guarded with an antique gold dupioni silk that I got from Fabrics Wholesale Direct. Only the front of the bodice is boned and the back of it is unboned, but the back still has the same codal and mid-weight linen structure to help prevent it from stretching. After I finished the support structure, I covered it with the facing fabric and the lining fabric and then I sewed it all together by hand. The kirtle is side lacing and I did all of the lacing eyelets by hand with an embroidery floss that matches the color of the embroidery on the dress. I first finished the top of the skirt by sewing the lining and the facing fabric right sides together and flipping it so I had a nice clean edge and after that I treated the lining as an underlining. All of the skirt seams are done as French seams except for the very side seams which have the slit to allow me to get in and out of the dress. I also used the lining to finish these seams and then I opened up those seams and kind of stitched right along my stitching line so I got a really nice flat seam that I was able to end and then have a perfectly finished opening. The back of the skirt has two layers of the lightweight linen um, just for opacity and to match the drape and that is because I didn't have enough of the facing fabric to continue onto the back of the skirt. The skirt is two rectangles, one in the front and one in the back and four trapezoids, um, two on each side. So the trapezoids have one side with 90 degree angles and one angled side. So those two flat sides meet perfectly and then the other angles connect to the rectangles. Having the back of this dress be a different fabric and then ending it on the bottom with the facing fabric is actually the historical accurate method of doing this so that you could save some money on your nice expensive fabric Although, funnily enough, I actually paid less for this embroidered silk than I did for the linen because I got it on a super sale when Toto Fabrics was going out of business. However, if I had gone and needed to buy more of the silk, it would have been much more expensive than the linen, so this is what I did. The skirt was completely hemmed by hand, and then I sewed the horsehair interfacing in by hand, and then I attached the guard by hand completely, so there was no machine sewing in the bottom part of the skirt. Then I pleated the skirt, and since it was all finished on the top, I was easily able to whip stitch it to the completed edge of the bodice. The most difficult area for me to stitch the skirt on was on the back side of the boning because I did not cut the skirt to uh, follow the angle of the front point of the bodice. I'm really glad that I didn't do that because this was where I made a mistake. In all of the mock-ups that I made, I never wore them for a very long time. And so after I had made my completed bodice, 
I sat down in it and realized that I couldn't sit down because the front point was much too long. It looked amazing when I was standing, but it did not feel good when I was sitting. So I actually had to open up the entire bodice, take out all the boning and shorten them by a couple inches, and then reinsert them and reclose the bottom of the bodice so that it fit more correctly. The next pieces are the sleeves, and I made these sleeves following a historical pattern on a blog that I can't remember the name of, but I'll sure to be put it here on the screen. They are made with the antique gold and peony silk I got from Fabric Wholesale Direct and they are underlined with just a white handkerchief weight linen from fabricstore.com. They were completely embroidered by hand in flat pieces, which again is the historical method that they would have done embroidery, and then once I was finished with the embroidery, I constructed them with French seams. I used fusible web to help me flatline these pieces, and I used a one inch seam allowance and quarter inch fusible web to attach the silk to the linen. This was to help me prevent the fraying that I knew the silk would do while I was hand embroidering them, and then in the process of creating my French seams, I simply cut the fusible web off. I was having some trouble when I was fitting this pattern, and I felt like the upper arm was much too long, so I shortened it. But then, once I finished it, I realized that I couldn't actually reach the top of the sleeve all the way up to the strap of my kirtle. I probably needed to just decrease the underarm piece and, and keep the same length on the overarm piece, but I was finding the extreme angle that the two pieces are sewn together to be difficult to follow, so I kept it as it is. And instead, I just pinned the sleeves to the flat felt seam of my shift, which is really strong. The next piece is my gown, and this was made following the pattern for the fitted English woman's gown from the Tudor Taylor. This gown is made from a tropical weight silk that I got from Mary Jo's in Gastonia, North Carolina, and it's underlined with a medium weight linen from fabricstore.com. The bodice has an additional layer of muslin from Fabric Wholesale Direct, and the bottom of the skirt is guarded with micro velvet from also from Fabric Wholesale Direct. Additionally, there is some white silk du peony in the sleeves that was a de-sash from a friend, and the entire gown has hand-stitched navy velvet trim. The wider trim is from Psy Fabrics, and the narrow trim I got on Etsy is no, and no longer available. Originally, I went to the LA Garment District to find the fabric for this gown because I knew that I wanted to make it from a lightweight wool, and I found a beautiful one at B. Black & Sons, but it was very expensive. And then I found another one that I really liked uh, that was much cheaper at another store, so I bought about five yards of it. But I learned my lesson. I had, did not bring a lighter with me when I went shopping, and once I got home and did a burn test, I realized that the fabric that I bought wasn't 100% wool. I was going to order the very expensive fabric from B. Black & Sons, but I went to Mary Jo's on a whim, and when I found this 100% um, weight tropical wool suiting for $9 a yard, I was ecstatic, even though it wasn't as pretty as the one I had found from B. Black & Sons. The bodice underlining layers of muslin and linen are pad stitched together, and I did that in order to stiffen the bodice, but unfortunately it didn't turn out as stiff as I had intended. The first order of muslin that I got from Fabric Wholesale Direct was really stiff, but the second order that I got from them was much softer, and so even after the pad stitching that I did, it didn't have my intended weight. Luckily, since I made a stiffened foundation layer, I don't have too much issue with wrinkling or buckling. This pattern calls for a traditional lining, but I simply underlined the bodice with the pad stitch pieces, and then used a facing in order to cover the collar area. To finish the seams, I used a bias strip that I cut from the middle weight linen, and I also used that same bias strip to clean finish the edges of the armholes and the bottom of the bodice. The front of this gown closes with hooks and eyes. The skirt I did very similar in the way that I did the skirt for my kirtle. I used the underlining to first clean finish the top edges of the skirt, and then treated the two pieces as one, and I constructed the skirt with French seams. I had to piece the skirt together because these skirt pattern pieces were quite wide, and this was my first time piecing. And of course, the wool and the linen were two different widths, so I had to piece them separately. The wool I only pieced with normal seams, and the linen I pieced with flat felt seams since you would be able to see it more on the inside. I did not even have enough linen, so I had to get very creative and have multiple pieces, while with the wool I had just barely enough. Unfortunately, in all of the linen that I was piecing together, I got confused and wound up cutting an angle wrong. So the linen does not extend fully to the front edge of the skirt, but luckily the front edge of the skirt is turned in 3 inches, so it mostly covers it except for on one side. After I constructed the skirt, I cartridge pleated the back of the skirt and attached the finished edge to the finished edge of the bodice. This was another area in which something was wrong. I cannot remember because it was so long ago when I when I altered this bodice pattern, but I may have deepened the front V. Therefore, the curve on the front of the skirt and the front V of the bodice were not true, and the front part panels of the skirt hung with 
buckles in them because they weren't on the correct angle. Luckily, since I finished the top of the skirt completely cleanly, I simply cut it off from the bodice and then tucked it into itself in order to rise up the skirt so that it met and now falls smoothly. Then I hemmed the skirt by hand and I attached the velvet guard first with a machine and turned it to the inside and tacked down the underside by hand. I made significant changes to the bodice of this pattern and I was not the only person that had this particular issue. When I first constructed the pattern, there was a lot of excess fabric in the back and neck area and I found a fix for this on the blog Wasted Weeds. The fix was to move the uh, shoulder seams backwards so that it took out a lot of the extra fabric. And this helped a lot for me, but I do have a rounded upper back so it didn't go far, far enough. The fix that I did was to add a center back seam, which was not originally in the pattern. This allowed me to sew the center back seam with a slight curve and pull in the rest of the top of the bodice all the way up to the back of my neck. The puffed and pained sleeves that I created, I actually made two videos on how I made them. So if you're interested in finding out more about how I made them, you can follow the link above. While overall I am so happy with the garment this pattern produced, I don't know if I would use the pattern again. I definitely felt like I needed help constructing something with this shape since I had never made something like that before. But now that I understand more how the pattern pieces go together, I don't think I would necessarily use the pattern again. This pattern I often see recommended to beginner Elizabethan costumers and this pattern company as a whole, but I don't think that it's very beginner friendly. The whole pattern only included a single sheet of paper's worth of instructions, and the paper was printed front and back. But while there were pictures of things like knife pleating that I don't think they needed pictures of, there were no pictures of the very complicated pieces like the sleeve construction. That's actually why I made the videos, because I had such a hard time understanding the sleeve instructions, and I felt like other people might have had that difficult time as well. I also depended on people's blogs like the Wasted Weeds blog in order to help me understand the significant fit issues I had with the pattern. I think that the Tudor Tailor is a fantastic resource on historical garment construction and I hear that their book is fantastic although I don't own it and that might have solved some of the issues I had with understanding the pattern. The last piece is a hat that I drafted and completely made by myself although I was very inspired by the work of another hat maker. The brim of this hat is constructed with buckram which is edged in wire and then the entire hat is covered in the same wool fabric as the dress. The fabric also has an underlining of some cotton flannel that I just bought from Hobby Lobby that also helps to pad out the brim of the hat so the wire isn't as noticeable. To construct the hat I cut out a large circle and knife pleated it down so that it fit the brim of the hat and sewed it on by hand. After I was done with that I attached one of the same velvet ribbons from my dress around the brim and finally added a feather collection which I got from Feathers of Fancy at the Renaissance Festival. Thanks so much for watching. If you'd like to see me actually getting into this garment, you can click on the sister video I have linked here. I know I haven't been posting a lot of videos lately and that's because I've been so busy at the Renaissance Festival, but I promise that it's almost over and new videos will be coming soon. So make sure you subscribe to see any new videos and also follow me on Instagram. Peace.